Dr. Doug Lucas, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. What's good, brother? Oh man, so many things are good, but I'm I'm super happy to be here. Uh, super excited to have you. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. I'm excited for myself to have the opportunity just to to bro out a little bit, chat with you. I always learn when we have conversations and to give our audience the opportunity to learn from you because you are a pretty damn smart dude. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of topics around health, muscle health, optimization, medicine in general that we can talk about. And so uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, Dr. Doug, so for those, uh, our listeners who I'm sure perhaps are not familiar with who you are, what you do, give us a little rundown of, of what that looks like. Yeah. Well, thanks for those kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. My short, short summary of how I got here is I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, uh, did that traditional medical model thing for about seven years after finishing fellowship and really felt that there was something missing in how I was meant to serve people and how I liked to educate and serve my patients. So I created my own practice after receiving some additional training in anti-aging and metabolic medicine and functional medicine. So now I run two parallel companies. One's called Optimal Human Health and the other one's called Optimal Bone Health. Same group, same team, just two different facing companies for two different facing problems. Obviously, that's a huge transition. I, I imagine having done all of the work and time and mm -hmm. commitment and energy put towards becoming an orthopedic surgeon only to, uh, and tell us, you know, to come to the realization that like, this is not what I want for my life, for my family. What was that aha? And why did you make that decision ultimately? Yeah, it was a really tough decision because I loved operating. I mean, I, I really liked how I could affect people's lives. I liked the change that I could make, you know, with stainless steel and with a scalpel and with all the fun tools that we have at our disposal. It was it was a lot of fun. But what I found is that mostly what I was doing was cleaning up after years and years of metabolic disease, after years of bad decisions or bad information or both coming in and people asking me to rescue them with a surgery. And a lot of times that didn't leave them with where they wanted to be because what they needed to do was to focus on the hard things mm -hmm. years and years ago. And now as a surgeon, I could make them different, but I couldn't necessarily make them better. Not to say that I didn't never made people better, but especially in my subspecialty, which is foot and ankle, I would see a lot of obesity, a lot of diabetes, a lot of chronic problems, people that come in and say, I need you to make my foot better. And I just you would want to talk to them about nutrition, about activity, about all the other lifestyle things. And I was, I would sit there and talk to them about how to prevent surgery. And they would look at me with a blank face and, and kind of wonder, well, what about the surgery? You know, you're my surgeon. <laughs> right. And so after, after several hundred of those conversations, I realized that, man, I'm probably in the wrong place. You know, it's a paradox. And I, and I applaud you for that because I don't think it's it's that uncommon for orthopedic surgeons to just be myopically focused on you're here to get the surgery, right? And say, this right. is what I do. This is my specialty. And frankly, to just be dismissive of the fact that had we had a conversation 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't be here in front of me. And so I'm just going to stay in my lane. <laughs> but you here I'm, are now. Yeah. 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 And, and you're here. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you know, I applaud you for that and how frustrating it must have been for you to care enough, you know, to say, had we had this conversation years and years ago, like we wouldn't be having it now. And now I can help to a degree, but let's just acknowledge that this is perhaps a little more than a band aid, but nonetheless, it's not going to take the place right. of you starting to live a healthier lifestyle through nutrition and physical activity and, and mindset and all of those things. And so what did that look like for you to make that transition through your practice? Because I know you have a family and, and so that must have been a very delicate situation to some degree. Sure. Yeah, I, I was extremely fortunate in that I was able to, first of all, have a practice where I could explore these things. And so I was in a practice where 
I, yes, they, I, I had to do surgery and yes, I had to be productive, but I wasn't really under the thumb of having to be as productive as some of my peers. So I was able to take the time, have those conversations and really explore that for myself. And once I started figuring it out, you know, my wife and I would have these conversations and she was supportive of me making a move. But obviously, yeah, there's that issue of, okay, well, we have a house payment and we have these obligations. And she had started a company right when I started practice. And was doing well enough that we could, you know, combine our resources and say, okay, well, let's let's make this leap together, and um, we can batten down the hatches and we can make this happen. So I get a lot of a lot of questions from physicians who who want to make a change, and that's the biggest thing I say is, you know, anticipate if you're going to make a move like I did, which is a complete pivot. Man, you're you're not going to make money for a couple of years. That's yeah. really hard to do. Most definitely, being a a physician, do you see that this is a recurring theme within our conventional mm -hmm. medicine realm? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's gotten so much worse with the pandemic and, and how physicians were forced to really do a lot of things they didn't want to do during the pandemic, whether it be, you know, go to the hospital when they wanted to stay home or yeah. see patients that they didn't want to see or, you know, all of the restrictions. So it really drove a lot of physicians out. And I see physicians that are either going into other fields altogether or mm. trying to make a move like I did, but it's really tough, you know, and again, it's, it is rare for someone to have the resources and to have the ability to actually just stop making income in their forties. You know, it's just, it's a very difficult time to be able to do that. So I get extremely fortunate that I was able to do that, but we've always We've always been big on saving and big on living way underneath our means. And that's why. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And how challenging that must be for, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly respectable and commendable and understandable that, uh, physicians are wanting to make that pivot now with everything going on. And especially, you know, with, with what we talk about on this show of of understanding the importance of nutrition and lifestyle and exercise as it pertains to long term health and the fact that we have full control over the outcomes of our of our life, you know, to a vast degree, um, and so obviously that is something now that you have the privilege, and I'm sure have worked very very hard on improving and, and taking control over in your life with your business. And so tell us what you do uh, around helping others optimize their health and longevity through your practice. And, and let's talk about both categories, sure. you know, both the optimizing human health as well as uh, optimal bone health. Yeah. Well, and really the, I'll just start backwards. The optimal bone health side is, is honestly just an extension of the platform that we built for optimizing human health. So I'll start at the beginning, which is when I had the ability to launch this thing, I wanted to, to take a step back and say, okay, how, if you were to ask me from different perspectives, how can I best help you? What are all the pieces that we need to put together? And we, we came up with a lot of different versions of it, but ultimately it's a combination of some kind of a coaching platform. So we work with coaches, we work with people that have extensive education in nutrition and gut health and supplementation. We bring people on as a membership type of platform. So instead of just going to the doctor and getting recommendations and then following up whenever you feel like it, we say, no, we're going to bring you in for a certain period of time. And in general, that's 12 months for us. We bring people on for 12 months so they have the resources. They're not worried about the the nitpicky, you know, nickel and diming them here or there for this or that. Right. Or say, no, you're, you're in. You're in. You're committed. Let's do this. Uh, you meet with the coaching team, we get extensive labs. And so those labs include uh, blood labs for everybody that's part of the program. And then we have the ability to do all the functional testing that people might hear about, whether it be sal salivary or saliva cortisol, mm -hmm. hormone testing through either blood or elsewhere, functional testing that through the gut, through stool testing, all those fun things. So we can add all those things on as an extra layer, um, including genetics. That's a big part of it too. Um, so we can get more and more information. Once we have all that information, you sit down with the physician and there's two of us with a third potentially joining us now. And we go through all those results together and we come up with a plan. That plan is going to include lifestyle as a primary tool, custom targeted supplementation for the things that you're truly deficient in, not just guessing. 
And then we're going to talk about advanced modalities like peptides, hormone, either optimization or supplementation or replacement. Um, and then ultimately we have the ability to prescribe pharmaceuticals, although we uh, almost never do. Yeah, that sounds insanely comprehensive. And so within that, as you're getting this comprehensive look, right, you're, you're kind of encompassing everything where you're saying, all right, we've got all of the pieces here. What's going to make the most sense? How do we build the roadmap, right? To take you from where we are now to where you want to go, understanding that there's probably only so much that someone's willing to do at once. How are we going to do it sure. in a way that's realistic for them? Albeit, it sounds like by virtue of them committing to this process, it's probably going to be a bit more aggressive than... Yeah your average, just one off meeting with a trainer, meeting with a nutritionist, meeting sure. with a functional medicine doc, you've kind of combined everything into one. Is that fair? Yeah. And that's, a, that's our plan. We can always adjust based off of, of interest, based off of how aggressive people want to be. As an orthopedic surgeon, I'm kind of known, there's this old dogma in the orthopedic world where if it doesn't fit, you just get a bigger hammer. Yeah, and that's right. <laughs> that's kind of the, the way that I approach these things sometimes, which is the bigger your problem is, the harder I want to hit it. Mm. Um, it. But the nice thing is I, my coaching team will give me some feedback and say, wow, <laughs> Doug, man, uh, that's a lot of stuff. You know, nobody's going to take that. So we have this, this back and forth. And when I go through the results review with the patient, I have a comprehensive list of everything I want them to do. And I go through it step by step with them and say, okay, this is for this. Is this okay with you? And we kind of go one by one by one. So I get buy-in on every single piece of it. So now, you know, early on, this actually was an issue, but now people are very comfortable because they've already told me, hey, that's too much. Or, hey, you know, I, I don't want to replace my hormones. I don't want to go down this pathway. It's fine. I don't want to use peptides. Fine. You know, because we have so many options, there are so many different ways to do it but we have all these different tools and I want to, my job is to put them together in a way that'll work. What are the most uh, frequent goals, pain points, complaints that you are getting from clients when they come in? What is it that they're really looking to achieve? Yeah, this has kind of changed as the practice has evolved. So if I, if I were to look at my group of you know, my most recent patients, I would say about half of them are people that are coming in with osteoporosis and osteopenia. Okay. So this is something that we're we're really pushing, and our if you uh, people, I'm sure will be able to link to our YouTube channel, um, and it's all about bone health right now. And this isn't all we do, but I really want to push the bone health side because people with osteoporosis and osteopenia are massively underserved in the traditional medical model. So we're creating this platform specifically in a way that can serve them. So that's that's a big one, um, and then. As we go back, you know, kind of go back in time, I serve a lot of people that are relatively high performer, whether they be physician, you know, CEO, C-suite type of people that have very limited time and are just looking for, okay, if I have X amount of time and X amount of dollars, what are the tools at my disposal? Because we could be creative like that. And that's again, right. where peptides and hormone replacement comes in. How can we really dial these things in? Then we also, if I keep going back in time, then I see a lot more people that are trying to maintain weight loss. And this comes from my wife's company, which is weight loss. Um, and so her company, PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition, they see several thousand people a year through their program. And people will sometimes come out on the other end and struggle to maintain their weight, not because they don't have their nutrition and their, their lifestyle dialed in, but because something is wrong, whether it be thyroid or hormone optimization or whatever it is. Uh, and so those are people that used to be in most of our clients. And now we, we've sort of broadened our horizon from there. Based on your experience, having worked with a platitude of demographics at this point, um, and in, in really a number of different ways, which is remarkable, what do you see as sort of the hierarchy of importance Mm. Uh, for people in terms of creating the change in their life. And I guess I think back to, you know, you as a surgeon and saying, hey, if we had had this conversation 20 yeah. or 30 years ago, like what would the conversation be that you think is, again, in hierarchical structure? I look at this almost like a longevity anti-aging approach. And this is kind of where I think I think the optimal human health side is is going is really in this anti-aging longevity perspective because that's really how I look at it. And when I describe this, I describe it as a triangle and, and the foundation, the bottom part of that triangle is all about lifestyle. It's all about what we call the, you know, the four 
tenants of health, which are going to be sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation, right? If you don't have those four things, there isn't mm -hmm. a supplement peptide or hormone that I can give you that's going to make you better. It just isn't. So you start there. And then the next level from there is going to be targeted supplementation. And I'm a big advocate for supplementation, but without testing, you're really guessing. And there are so many things that we can test and we can't test them all, but there are so many things that we can test that if you can test, figure out what you need, then you know, and you get buy-in as to you know why you're taking this thing. That's going to ultimately, you're going to get tired and stop taking it over time if you don't know why you're taking it. And then the level above that, I would say is hormone optimization. So that's, that's not necessarily a replacement, but making sure that your levels are optimized, doing the best thing that you can to get them there. And then if you can't get them there, then consider replacing them in the right circumstances. And then the layer above that's going to be peptides. And, and I know you want to talk about peptides and I love talking about peptides because I think they're way underutilized and they're mm. very powerful. Um, and then the, the very tip of that triangle is going to be pharmaceuticals, you know, and, and under the right circumstances, we do end up recommending them in some patients, but it's pretty darn rare. Beautiful, man. And I, I love that structure right there. It seems like it makes perfect sense. And it's so in line with our values at BSL Nutrition and kind of the way in which we help, you know, work to serve people. And we talk all the time about the foundational layers of that hierarchy. We talk all the time about sleep and nutrition and exercise and stress mitigation. We talk about supplementation to some degree, however, in full agreement that it's nothing without that base layer. And so I don't need to spend time with you talking about that. I think our audience is really looking to kind of dive more into your expertise. So specifically around peptides and pharmaceuticals, yeah. I think mostly because it's very timely also. And there's so much information around it saying, hey, should I be utilizing peptides? If so, what peptides? Is this really going to help me under what circumstances? And then when do we look at pharmaceuticals? Since it does seem like conventional medicine, we're taking a top-down approach right now. Oh, yeah. I would love your insight there. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love that, that perspective, which is, let's just assume that all those other things are true. Now, how can we add this okay, next layer? Right. It's like the icing on the cake, right? Right. Yeah. So, so where do you want to start? So let's talk, what are peptides? How should they be utilized? Let's talk a couple specific ones. Um, let's just start general and, and then go specific. So if you haven't heard about peptides, um, it's a really interesting space. And the way I describe it to my patients is peptides are basically signaling molecules. They are generally naturally occurring but they live in the space between supplements and pharmaceuticals, meaning that they are prescription products generally made by a compounding pharmacy. They are not made by drug companies. Therefore, the FDA does not regulate them, which makes them a little bit awkward because the FDA doesn't like them. They're powerful. They can really impact people. They're relatively safe because they are naturally occurring molecules, but they have to be made carefully. And that's why if you go, if you go online and you search peptides, you can see direct to consumer. For the most part, I'm not an advocate of those approaches. It kind of depends on the peptides. Some are more safe than others, but that's the space that we're talking about. Okay, absolutely. And so these signaling molecules can facilitate different reactions in the body yeah. depending on what it is that we're looking for. And so, sort of, what's the understood methodology around how do we use them? What are we using them for? And again, when do we take these into consideration? So, and one thing I didn't mention, they are, for people that are, are wondering what a signaling molecule is, consider them like short proteins. And if you look at things like hormones in your body, look at other things that are communicating from cell to cell and organ to organ in the body, they're basically just a series of amino acids that are strung together in a certain chain that are going to be able to uh, identify with a specific receptor somewhere else and cause some kind of a, a downstream reaction. So similar to say like a hormone in your body, these are going to be able to have an impact, but on different types of receptors and they're not necessarily all hormone driven. And so what sort of reactions are we working to stimulate yeah. by virtue of utilizing the peptides? Yeah, it really, it really varies on patient's goals. So I have a, a list of, I don't know, somewhere of like 30 to 40 different options that I can potentially prescribe. We have about 10 that we do on a regular basis. 
So if it is, let's say it's a patient that, you know, weight loss is a really hot thing, right? And so the GLP-1 agonists are very popular right now. Um, and so those are going to be things on the generic side, they're going to be things like semaglutide, terzepatide. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, these are pharmaceuticals, right? These are drugs. And they are drugs and they are made by drug companies, but they are also peptides. And the reason why they're peptides is because these are fragments of naturally occurring hormones. Or, or they are fragments of something that can interact with the receptor. So if, a, if you listen to what I just said, a GLP-1 agonist right. or a GIP agonist, these are hormone receptors in your body. Now, the drug companies have been able to make these drugs and patent them because of certain characteristics of the molecules, but they can also be compounded. So this is where, where peptides and pharmaceuticals do cross over. And legally, I might add, <laughs> but this is a really hot area where people want to use these for weight loss. And we can get into that. There are a number of these uh, peptides that can be used for uh, metabolic optimization, maintaining muscle mass. So you get into the, um, the IGF-1 category. So that's insulin-like growth factor. And to increase insulin-like growth factor, you could potentially help with uh, improving your muscle mass, improving body composition. There are also reports of improved mental clarity, improved energy, better sleep. I mean, so those sleep are, would be in there. Yeah. Yeah. So those would be things like uh, sermorlin, uh, ipamorlin, abutamorin, uh, CJC. So there's a whole whole yeah. group of these different peptides. They're very popular. And then there are some that don't really fit well into a category. So two of my favorites uh, are melanotan 2 and another one is AOD. So melanotan 2 uh, works through the MSH or melanotite stimulating hormone receptors. And it has some really interesting properties. AOD is part of the growth hormone. So it's a fragment of growth hormone. So it has some of the effects of growth hormone, but not all the effects. And then there's a whole section on the immune system, a whole section on longevity. Um, so I could just keep going and going, but I'll blabber on forever. Dude, intriguing. And, <laughs> and so let's start with maybe, let's just talk a little bit about some of maybe the IGF growth hormone agonist, um, you know, stimulating products. And then I, because I absolutely want to come back to the uh, GLP-1 agonists. Okay. So I'm almost 44. I'm obviously very health conscious. I obviously take great care of myself. I eat pretty darn well. I obviously exercise very hard. I think that there's a lot of men and women probably in similar situations that uh, listen to this podcast that are kind of like, okay, what are sort of the next logical steps for me? And there's this perhaps unspeakable stigma around where do the lines blur between yeah. these, these naturally occurring proteins, compounded proteins, what have you around things that steps that I can take to continue to quote unquote, optimize my health, perhaps to help me listen, we're all under tremendous amounts of stress. We're all exposed right. to environmental toxicity, blah, blah, blah. So I could probably sleep better. I could probably have more energy. I could probably recover better from exercise. You know, I could probably get some joint support on and on and on. And so what's your perspective yeah. around where those lines blur and perhaps how we should be thinking about it? Yeah. So this is a really tough one because if you just take the population as a whole and say, well, everybody needs this, you're going to hit some people square and you're going to miss a lot of people. And this is the kind of the approach that medicine is taking, which is we're just going to treat the population, right? But we know that a precision health, a customized healthcare plan is going to be much more effective for everybody, but it's harder to do. So I, I look at this and I say, well, let's meet you where you are. You know, so let's just use you as an example. Like you are obviously motivated. You're doing all those things that you just said. So where do you need me to intervene? Well, you don't probably need me to tell you about your nutrition. You don't probably need me to tell you to sleep more. Maybe we could review sleep hygiene briefly, figure out whatever, you know, your Netflix obsession. You know, <laughs> not me, but I get it. How to manage that. Yeah. You know, but but pick out those things. So then for you, we're more likely to say, hey, let's really dig into the peptide space. Or, you know, let's see, like, are you are you motivated enough to replace testosterone if we can't get it naturally to an optimized level? Um, you know, really hitting those things rather than someone who comes to me has terrible sleep, you know, doesn't make any time for themselves, you know, where we really say, hey, you know, yeah, we could definitely replace your testosterone. We could definitely put you on peptides to make you feel better right away. But 
let's focus on the lifestyle stuff first. And this is where also my coaching team, you know, they'll come to me and I'll actually, we had this conversation recently about the, the GLP ones and my coaches are saying, Hey, you know, I can get them there without these things. Right. And so it's this back and forth of saying, well, when does somebody need a tool and when do they need to, to really buckle down and focus on the, the basic things? So it is really just meeting them where they are and then deciding how motivated are they uh, and what are their resources to do so. This is something I think about a lot because as much as we would love to be able to quote unquote, optimize our health just by eating clean, quote unquote, clean, just by exercising enough, just by managing stress. Is there something to be said in your opinion around the fact that perhaps there's just too many factors that are pitted against us yeah. to be able to realistically do that? Yeah. Well, and I think this is where people start to feel a lot of guilt, right? They're like, oh, you know, I'm eating clean. I'm working on this. I'm trying to get to the gym, you know, and then they just, they're failing, you know, their health's getting worse and their weight's yeah. getting, their weight's going up. Right. And they're, they look at Instagram. They're like, look at all these people that are successful. Mm. I must, I must just be worthless. Right. And you get so much guilt in that space. And, and the truth is, is that we live in a toxic world. We live in a in a fake world on social media, right? Like the things that you are shown, we all know this is true. Like there's Instagram yeah, and know, reality, absolutely. right? Yeah. Right. And so we are all sort of stuck in this space where again, you have to really understand where you are and and talk to somebody who can help you to see this perspective, which is, you know, and I look at myself, you know, like I would love to be more muscular and I would love to sleep better. And I would love to like, I would love to be able to say that my labs look perfect. They don't. It's not because I'm not trying. I've got my own genetics. I have three kids. We have three businesses, you know, like right. everybody has their factors. And, you know, so I know that I need some support in some areas. I use peptides. I kind of rotate them through. I was on testosterone for a while because my testosterone levels just would not stay elevated naturally because I, you know, my, my four-year-old at the time, it just wasn't sleeping, you know, so it's like, I didn't sleep for whatever, six months. I'm off of that now. And I was able to rotate through that. And that's where you just really have to understand like, okay, let's meet people where they are and understand how can we support them? What are they interested in doing? And really what are their realistic goals? Yeah. I appreciate that perspective. And I think, you know, the biggest takeaway for me, because I'm, I'm not in a dissimilar situation. It's one thing for me personally, just, just being very open and honest here is like for me to consider peptides or testosterone optimization, frankly, there's part of me that feels like it's almost cheating, right? Like yeah. I have this impression to uphold to my clients and to right. my followers of like the, I've, I've accomplished this by myself with no help other than what I just preach on a daily basis. Sure. And, and, and where I think that there's obviously nuances to that, but um, I don't think it's wrong for someone to acknowledge just like, listen, if I'm doing all of the things, and this is where it's like, are we being honest with ourselves here? Absolutely. Right? Around, am I actually doing the things that are going to move the needle that are potentially low hanging me fruit? Am I really managing my stress? Am I really setting myself yeah. up to get better sleep? Am I really eating the quality foods or and, and being conscious of how my calories are adding up or exercising in concerted ways to the degree that assuming we are, then it's okay to say, well, what's the next step? And the beautiful thing about modern medicine is exactly that, to say, well, we have ways to now right. actually optimize your health, to say, maybe you can't in this day and age, get there on your own based on years of poor eating and lifestyle. Right. And you put right. yourself in this position in concert mm -hmm. with genetics and it just is the way it is. So now acknowledging is like, Hey, maybe there are some ancillary things that we can do right. to really just raise the bar, raise the bar. And it sounds like that's really where hormone optimization and then peptide support can really come into play those. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, I, and actually, I can use myself as a great example, because I see this in different versions in, in my patients, which is, 
you know, I talk a lot about bone health. I actually have osteopenia myself, which is, you wouldn't think that's true for a no, you know, 190 not. pound muscular guy, right? But I was raised in a household where, you know, my parents thought they were doing the best thing they could for me by feeding me a very low fat diet. Right. Mm. This was, you know, this was the eighties. Right. Right. So everybody was afraid of dietary fat. And so I ate basically like a 90, 95% carbohydrate diet. And guess what? My A1C was elevated. My glucose was elevated. My metabolic dysfunction, like all that stuff happened. Um, and my cholesterol never went down because guess what? They're not correlated. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so by in doing that though, I have, I was protein deficient. I was dietary fat deficient. I was probably fat soluble vitamin deficient. Right. And so I never achieved peak bone mass would be my guess. I know I had a DEXA in my, my mid twenties that showed I was, um, I had osteopenia and it's the, stayed the same. Another good example is that my my fasting glucose is always elevated now. My A1C kind of floats high. I eat less than 50 grams of carbs a day, right? Mm. So my labs don't look great, not because I'm not eating the right diet, but because of the metabolic damage that's been done throughout the course of my life. I can't change that. I look at my diabetic patients who have put their diabetes in remission they want to go back like, well, I can, you know, now that my diabetes is in remission, I can, I can go back and eat pizza in calzones. And, you know, I'm right. like, no, no, you can't. Exactly. Man. Your metabolism is broken. It's better. You don't have diabetes. You're not going to suffer the wrath of diabetes, but you can't go back. So let's take you where you are and how can we support you? Right. So how can we, how can we give you the, the cutting edge tools that we have available to us and help you to live the best life that you can live for you? Uh, and that's that's what I really like to do because these these are the type of people, and I'm this I'm in the same group. You're in the same group. You go to your doctor, and you're like, "Well, I, I want to feel better. I'm tired. I have this. I have that." They're gonna look at you and go, "Dude, you're good. Yeah, exactly. Like, like you're you're fine. You know, you're in such good shape." The truth is, is that when you run through my lab panel, I will th point out all kinds of holes, right? Because nobody's perfect. We all have things we can work on, but the bar is so low in the traditional medical model that it's really looking for outright sickness, not health, right? We call it healthcare. It's not healthcare. It's sick care. You get sick, you can get treated. Hopefully you can get better, but you want to get healthy. You have to look outside of that. Yeah. We always talk about how standard labs are based on, are basically Homer Simpson labs, <laughs> That's right? right? That's right. And, yeah. and so it's just acknowledging, all right, listen, we have to, we have to hold ourselves to different standards. Yeah. Because you do not want to be average in this day right. and age. Average right. is the enemy in every capacity. And by the way, it's not hard to set yourself apart from average, but to really get to top 10, 5, 1%, which also, by the way, is probably not that hard relative to the average. <laughs> it certainly does take more work, which is what this, this show is all about, what you're all about, what we are preaching here. Okay. I love that framing of how we can take advantage of peptides if, when important to help support everything from fat loss to recovery from exercise, sounds like joint health. I think gut health is yep. certainly something, sleep optimization, growth hormone function, which of course is going to affect all of those. I got to say, I didn't realize that the GLP-1 agonists, so we're talking about, right, could, all of the be, things that- yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize those were peptides. Uh, makes sense. But, and this is top of mind for everyone. You, uh, everyone is either, you know, you have a friend, perhaps you've had the conversation with the doctor. You're, you're hearing more and more about Ozempic and, and semaglutide, which are same thing. And right. you might hear Rebelsis, which is the oral semaglutide. And then the uh, Wegovi is the, the right. one that's FDA approved. It's same, same semaglutide. But it's uh, FDA approved for okay. uh, for weight loss. Beautiful. So okay. So what do we need to know about these things? What do they do? When are they appropriate? And then what mm -hmm. can we expect, both short yeah. and long term? Yeah, these are they're they're really interesting drugs. And and I, I'll be honest, when I saw them first come out, I was so worried about my wife's business because I thought, oh my gosh, we just found the cure to, to obesity. Right? I was like, ah. Oh! My wife's business is going to go out of business. But the truth is, is that if you look at the research behind these drugs, they do cause weight loss at a considerable rate. And what that means in the traditional medical models around, you know, 10 to 20% of your weight. 
basically we'll just do the the summary version which is it messes with the incretin hormones in your stomach it basically stimulates you to feel satiated so you mm -hmm. feel full and a lot of people that struggle with overweight and obesity report never feeling full and i'm the same way you know like i don't feel full until i've eaten so much that i physically feel like my stomach's going to explode and I have a lot of obesity in my family. So there's a the genetic component to that. I've tried semaglutide myself. And so I've been on basically what is Ozempic because mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to feel what that felt like. And I can tell you that I, I really did feel satiated, but uncomfortably so. And so people right. will report when they're on this drug, oh, it makes me nauseous. And I, I understand why they use that term because it's, if you overeat, definitely you can feel nauseous, but if you eat the right amount of food, which when you're on these drugs gets less and less. And I'll talk about that as a, as a problem. When you eat the right amount of food and you don't overdo it, you, you don't really feel nauseous. You feel really satiated. And one of the challenges is you feel really satiated for a long time. So I know people that will take these drugs and they'll eat one meal a day. Right. Because they're, they're just not hungry. Now you can imagine that that will absolutely stimulate weight loss, right? Even if you were to, let's just say it's all about calories, which I don't agree with, but let's just say it's all about calories. You're going to eat less calories. So you're going to lose weight. So they are effective just like any tool though. If you don't change the root behaviors, if you don't change your emotions around eating, if you don't change the quality of your food, if you stop using the tool, your weight will come back. And there's been some studies recently, oh my gosh, if you stop Ozempic, you're going to gain all your weight back. Well, duh, <laughs> That's not, right. it's not, it's not magic. And so I, I use them in my practice as a tool for people that are struggling mostly with overeating and binge eating at night. Because like I said, you eat a, a, a well-shaped crafted dinner with good dietary fat and protein forward, man, you are not going to feel like eating. So I, I really like them and I see good results in my patients that are in that group. Now, here's what I, I hear from my patients and what my fears are about these drugs is that when you eat satiating foods that are high in dietary fat and forward in protein, you get really full. So people tend to start shying away from those foods, which is a big problem. So one of my recommendations, strong recommendations for the optimal human diet is to eat a protein forward diet upwards of a gram or more per pound of desired body weight. Yep. That's hard to do on semaglutide. Like I it's I hard struggle. for people to do normally. You let alone. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree so, completely. Yeah. So people are gonna they start backing off of their protein, they're backing off their dietary fat. They start leaning into processed foods and higher carbohydrate source foods because it's all they can get down. Mm. Eating a big salad with a lot of olive oil on it and a good dressing is almost, I felt like it for me, it was impossible. So I think they're tools. I'm worried about people losing muscle mass because they're not getting adequate protein in their diet when they're when they're on these drugs. Not to say it's impossible. That's just what I see. Man, there's a lot of really good points in there. You know, do we really know kind of long term the implications of these drugs? No. And it's just like any drug, the longer it's on the market, the more likely we are to see some long term effect. Uh we don't we don't have long term data. And long term trials are are really difficult to do. So we don't know. I've, I've heard some reports and I haven't seen the studies myself, so I probably shouldn't even say it, but I've heard some reports of, I'm going to say it anyway. I've heard some reports of um, animal studies showing increase in the number of fat cells, you know, like for some, for some reason it can cause an increase in the number of fat cells. Again, I haven't seen that data myself. So that's, that's secondary, but uh, I, I don't, I don't know what we're going to see. I don't think that we should be on these drugs long term. I think that sure. in in the longevity community, we hear people say, "Oh, well, we'll take a low dose semaglutide forever." I'm like, wow, that's I don't think that's so. A good idea. <laughs> so no, this is great, and, and the, it, this is definitely getting my wheels turning. But the way that I'm thinking about it, as you explained it, is really like, okay, if we're taking this with the context of this, can be a very valuable tool. Again, if we're using it the right way, in which case it's an opportunity potentially for someone to drive some short-term aggressive change. Yep. 
yep. right? Where again, if someone has some very deranged eating behaviors, perhaps if they're morbidly obese or, or even just obese and having a hard time getting that kickstart that they yep. need, that there, there's a myriad of opportunities to, to take advantage of it. What we need to be cognizant about is uh, that throughout the process, they're making concerted change towards improving their behaviors and skills and knowledge around what needs to happen when they stop utilizing the drug to drive the change, to drive yeah. the caloric restriction and, and perhaps the uh, hormone um, support, the, the digestion hormone support that they're getting there in terms of the feelings of satiety. Uh, and start to infuse, obviously, the behaviors necessary to say, okay, how do I actually create appropriate portion sizes? How do I eat enough protein? How do I know what it feels like to be satiated between meals? And that way, we can leverage it as an optimization tool, potentially. But as long as, in your opinion, that we're looking at it as not a magic bullet, but as something that is going to be kind of a, a short-term solution to a, a much bigger, more complex problem. And the other thing, and then and then I'll let you jump in, is the things that we do need to be cognizant of is that, again, it's not potentially not a long-term solution to, to obesity, right? Because you're just not going to be getting enough nutrition in for the vast majority of people, but also from a lean muscle mass muscle as an organ health longevity and this goes to the other aspect of your business which is around bone health longevity yeah. muscle mass so i'll leave it at that with sort of the you know the stipulation that i want to go into the bone health yeah yeah and it is funny and i hear this from i've heard this just saying oh you know isn't that a little hypocritical when you're you're provoking protein deficiency in patients and you're causing the problem with what you treat and your other side of your business you know valid i'll take that but treating metabolic disease is primary exactly because because that's going to kill you quickly right, right. it's going to it's going to have a significant impact on your quality of life so if somebody is obese, they're, they have a, a significant weight journey, they're struggling with those things that I mentioned, I think it's a great tool to use because it does work. It is really powerful. So I, I love the fact that I have access to it. I love the fact that I can use it. I don't have that many patients on it, but the people that are using it, they're seeing really good success with it. So I, I do think it's a great tool, but I don't look at it as the alternative to the foundational things. Again, what's the bottom of that pyramid? It's lifestyle. Well, yeah, man, exactly. And, and just splitting hairs around like, you know, if we aggressively diet, you're going to lose muscle mass as 50% of the weight you lose. Maybe that's true. Maybe not with this drug, but what positive impact are you making sure. by virtue of losing that weight and improving metabolic health, metabolic flexibility, the mitochondrial function, just all of the yeah. disease to state so so many things get better right and and right. i'll tell you so just a really funny anecdote which is in my wife's business again weight loss business all behavior driven and nutrition in high success rates it's amazing but people come out and they've lost muscle mass you have to you cannot lose a significant amount of weight and not lose muscle mass right the goal though is to lose as little as possible because i really think that's one of the keys to maintaining weight loss Okay, so if somebody comes out on the other end of that, that's okay because now we have all these other tools. And I say, let's jump into those tools to say, great, let's help you get that muscle mass back while you're maintaining your weight. It is easier to maintain weight or slowly gain weight and gain muscle mass as opposed to preserving or or even, you know, people say, Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna gain 10 pounds of muscle mass and lose 30 pounds. I <laughs> know you're not. It's yeah, possible, exactly. but it's really hard. So, um, yeah. So, okay. Let's say you've lost all the weight. You've reversed your metabolic disease. Your diabetes is in, in remission and you don't have high blood pressure and all like your cholesterol is normalized. Cool. So now you feel like you want to put on some muscle mass. So we have peptides for that. Just piggybacking on the metabolic health is, is we've basically by virtue of losing the weight. I mean, you've, you've really created this, this, this better metabolic engine to actually be able to effectively put on lean muscle tissue, more effectively right. be able to utilize calories and those raw materials towards 
the muscle building process versus just storing everything as fat, just running on sugar all the time, yada, right. yada. So we are in a time where a very large percent of our population are baby boomers. And so we're, we're, we're getting to this really interesting stage uh, in life where we have a lot of these baby boomers that are getting sick, are experiencing osteopenia, osteoporosis. Yeah. What do we need to be concerned about and how does your business kind of work towards these things? Even as relatively young, healthy individuals, like why do we need to be concerned about bone health and, and longevity? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, and I can actually, I can combine the, the, the peptides for muscle mass with this conversation Perfect. because I actually mm -hmm. use them in, in both of these groups. So I'll give you the short version of osteoporosis awareness, which is you generally don't see people worry about osteoporosis until they're in their, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Like you think, well, this is a problem of my, my great grandmother or my grandmother, and I'm worried that she's going to fall and break her hip. Okay, that's fair. The problem is, is that, as I mentioned earlier, peak bone mass occurs early in adulthood, early 20s, actually. So really, we should be worried about bone health in our adolescence, in our childhood. That's why our kids need to eat real food, not mm. highly processed garbage. And that's why we need to be cognizant of activities and why we need to support the idea that kids need to get out and run and jump and fall and do all these things, because that's how you build bone mass. Once you're in your early 20s, it's done. It's over. Mm -hmm. And it's a downhill slide from there. The question is how slow? And if you think about, you know, statistically average, and we know we don't, we all don't want to be Homer Simpson. On average, you're going to lose one to two percent of your bone mass every year for the rest of your life. For women, this gets precipitously faster around menopause. Now, I would argue from a longevity perspective, we don't need to accept that. If we maintain optimal hormones, optimal nutrition, continue to exercise, do resistance training, I don't think that we need to see that. Or if we see it, it's going to be at such a slow rate that we could live to 130 and it's not going to be a problem. If you have a nice starting point, a really slow rate of bone loss, it's not going to be an issue. Problem is we have a bad starting point like I do. We have a bad starting point. We eat a terrible diet and then you lose all your hormones at, at menopause, or let's say you're on birth control or you're a woman, you're on a, yeah. an oral birth control, which is blocking your progesterone surge, blocking you from building bone. So you're only losing bone half of the month, every month, you're going to have osteoporosis really early. And I see that in my practice all the time. And this is why I started this business is because I see women and men in their 40s and 50s, they have osteoporosis. They've already had a fragility fracture and they've been told to take drugs, which they're going to have to take for the rest of their life. And they're not particularly effective and have significant risks. So that's a big bombshell for mm. somebody who's in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, yeah. who's hoping to live to their 80s, 90s, and 100s and have a good lifestyle. I could go through all of the statistics on how bad it is to have a hip fracture, but for the sake of time, let's just say it's really bad. The mm -hmm. likelihood of you recovering and recovering independence is about 30%. So we really want to avoid that. That's mind blowing. Makes perfect sense when you frame it like that around, wow, like really understanding as, and as a parent, right, of, of young children like already understanding, well, of course our kids need to eat healthy to prevent obesity and, and, and improve cognitive function and all of the things. But when you frame it around just longevity and bone health, like it adds just one more super important layer to the mix here. Yeah. And so what can we be doing right now that, I don't know if you were to drop a couple things, I think that it perhaps is going to be helpful for our listeners around this idea, perhaps from a, a nutrition lifestyle and then maybe a, a, a peptide standpoint. Well, I would say number one is figure out what your starting point is. So the screening, traditional screening for osteoporosis doesn't start for women until 65 and men for 70. That's insane. <laughs> And, and from a public health perspective, I get it because that's when you're going to identify it, right? So I totally understand the statistics behind it, but you prevent it and it's way easier to prevent bone loss than it is to rebuild bone. You can do both, but it's much easier to, to prevent it than it is to rebuild it. So know what your starting point is. 
and especially for women, if you're, you know, if you're a 45, 50 year old woman, you're staring down the, the realities of, of perimenopause and menopause, know what your starting point is, because once you lose estrogen, you are going to rapidly lose bone for the next 10 years. Just, mm. it, it's going to happen. So that decision around is hormone replacement, the right thing for you to consider knowing that piece of information can really make a difference in that conversation. Now, hormone replacement is not right for everybody, and it's not FDA approved for osteoporosis, just for the record, but it has a powerful effect on bones. So the way that you screen is by DEXA. Now, DEXA is not perfect, but you can go to your doctor and say, hey, I want a DEXA. They'll say, hey, Medicare won't pay for it. And you can say, I don't care. I'm going to pay the hundred bucks. And I yep. strongly, strongly right. recommend doing that. I could talk about all the risk factors, but let's just assume that everybody has one or more risk factors because they do. Um, so then what can you do? We just talked about from a diet perspective, protein forward diet, man, it's so important because muscle mass is intrinsically tied to bone mass. Once you start losing muscle, you will lose bone and vice versa. So uh, we don't know which one chicken or the egg, but I know which one's easier to build. It's muscle. Absolutely. Right? So so eat a protein forward diet. Number one, I'm a big advocate of animal protein and then, uh, you know, eliminating the things that are going to be toxic. So people, uh, generally don't tolerate gluten. People generally don't tolerate a lot of things, but let's just say gluten, let's say, you know, highly processed foods, let's say added sugar, all these things that are just naturally inflammatory you can get rid of them. Dairy is a plus or minus. Most people know if they tolerate it or not at this yeah, point. Totally. Um, it's a great source of dietary fat and calcium if you can, but not everybody can. In our population, it's about 50 50. Um, so, getting all that information in, getting all that food in, and then from an exercise perspective, resistance training is the most important thing. This is extremely variable and a huge challenge for us out of the gate, which is how do we give individual recommendations for exercise? And it's tough to do because everybody's at a different starting point. And yeah. the worst thing you could do at, at this point, if you have osteoporosis, is to suffer a fracture. Right. And so we have to be very careful in those recommendations, but doing something, starting somewhere, getting individualized recommendations, which is what you guys do, working with somebody who can say, okay, let's start here. Let's do this in particular, uh, you know, position and look at your form and how much weight and how do you grow from there? And, and those just starting there will fix a lot of stuff. There are a lot of tools we have, hormone optimization, replacement, peptide, all those things we can do to help that process along. But, you know, and like I mentioned my YouTube channel, like we're, we're putting a lot of this information out there because I find right. that this group, this bone health group is really underserved. It's a lot of confusing information, a lot of bad information in this space. So we're really trying to help to, to push this forward. Beautiful, man. Uh, well, we obviously will have all of the relevant links in the show notes below. So you guys make sure you go follow Dr. Doug at those. Listen, brother, is there anything else that you want to add? Yeah, I, I, I always end podcasts with this, which is, you know, we're here talking about a lot of stuff and people may agree or disagree with us. And, and ultimately, I don't care if you agree with me, but I think the most important thing is, is that you're an advocate for your health and you're finding what works for you. Like you said earlier, don't be okay with being Homer Simpson. Your life could be a whole lot better than that. Be an advocate for yourself. Find what works for you. Find the voices that you trust and can listen to and do it and just be great at it. Places where people can find me. I mentioned YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you'll have links to this, but it's just Dr. Doug Lucas on YouTube, on social media, Facebook, Instagram. We have channels and it's mostly now filtering down from, from YouTube. So we're really trying to focus on that video content. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Obviously we could, we could keep going. And so we will absolutely have to do it again. Thank you very much for your time. Doug, and uh, have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thanks, you too. And I, I, I'm always happy to do it again. Take care. All right. Bye.